Good morning. I'll shorten my introduction since we're a little late. Thanks for your patience. Uh, the town has engaged with um, uh, Geosyntec, uh, uh, Dr. Maura Boswell is going to speak today about the floodgate on Morris Island Road. Um, we know that, well, we know that the floodgate is 60 odd years old and is in need of attention. Um, but there was some questions internally about uh, the need for the floodgate. Uh, what is it, is it providing a service now, uh, given the, some of the changes we've seen on the east side? Um, so we're going to talk about that. We'll have some questions afterwards. Thanks. Morning. Um, so as Stuart said, we um, started, uh, this is our first uh, assessment. Let me, I'm just going to go through some background, the data assessment that we conducted, um, and then the next steps and some questions, which is kind of, I think, where everyone's more interested in, in um, some feedback. Um, so as Stuart mentioned, the existing deployable floodgate was designed by the Corps um, in approximately the 1950s. It's a, a timber deployable structure to put out when you when you need to, and it was um, intended for flood protection from primarily southerly events. So it's definitely not for all types of storms, and need to be um, cognizant of when it, it is um, not needed to to deploy the um, the floodgate. Um, the design life has obviously been exceeded after after this many decades, um, and just based on anecdotal evidence that we collected, it's been inoperable since about the 1990s. Um, feel free to correct me if that is wrong, but that's the, the data that we were able to um, ascertain. Um, in the Chatham Community Resilience Building Workshop, the summary of findings report um, identified the floodgate as something that the town wanted to um, assess and see you know, the necessity of it and new design um, and when it would be um, necessary to deploy it. So right now, um, we're at the first step of data assessment, um, and then we'd go into a conditions assessment, the design, permitting, and construction. So the initial data assessment is to um, ascertain what data are available um, within the project area to really be able to do a conditions assessment of the gate to see um, when it would be um, necessary to tie it to certain events. Um, do we have enough coastal wind, wave, um, storm data to make that assessment? Or do we need to go out and collect um, additional data needs? So before we get into design, we, we want to make sure that, that we have the necessary data um, to study. So first, we're going to just go through all the data that we were able to collect. So. Um, there is good topography and uh, bathymetry. Uh, we were able to collect LIDAR um, data. There's a USGS and um, US Corps um, both have data sets in the area and they go down to about negative three feet, negative 11 feet, so it actually you know, penetrates into the water, good coverage of the project area. Um, and there's good consistency between the 2018 and 2021 LIDAR data sets, so that really gives you um, an idea that, that this is um, a sufficient coverage and that these data are, are reliable. Um, then as far as bathymetry goes, we do have um, nautical charts, not very detailed um, bathymetry at the area, obviously just used more for navigation. And then in the, um, the core dredging channels, they do have more detailed um, bathymetry of the area. Um, we want to look at water levels when we're talking about a floodgate um, to, to see the appropriate um, protection. So we are um, nearby. We have um, the NOAA tidal stations. Um, so we're able to get some of our daily um, water levels um, at a nearby station, which is good to be able to see the daily operations. And then we also have um, some of the storm and extreme events, which is, is more when the, the tide or the floodgate would be um, deployed. So we want to know that we have those conditions under, under which we can assess um, this, this gate. Um, we also have the Massachusetts CZM sea level rise and coastal flooding viewer. So this provides three um, different types of maps. You have the sea level rise map, and this is based on what we call a bathtub model. So you just, like you're filling a bathtub, you add the water, and based on what your elevation is, it um, just fills up and shows you where it would flood. It doesn't account for any storms. Um, as we were just discussing, depending on what kind of storm you get, if you have a, a slow moving storm that just kind of sits off the coast and just keeps spinning and spinning, um, you'll see more flooding as more of the water is pushed inland. So the bathtub model um, doesn't necessarily show you that, um, but it's a good, a good baseline. Um, 
the coastal risk model actually accounts a little bit more for some of the um, storm conditions. So you can see a little bit more what the wave and the storm um, effects would have. And then the hurricane surge um, inundation model looks at different runs for different category storms um, to give you a, a better idea of flooding. So there's that. Um, then we have the um, sea level rise based on the NOAA 2017 core and the different scenarios um, helps to design to a specific scenario and, and you know, based on experience, we would, we would pick when we're seeing more towards the high and the extreme um, scenarios uh, that, that are being designed to, but that's one of the things that we would want to design to and look at um, in our design process. And then also, since we have the, the local buoys around here, we have um, flood stage levels, so you can see some of the different um, flooding in the region. So again, good coverage on that. Um, wind data, because that is, that is important when you're looking at, at flooding as well. Um, there is sufficient coverage on the um, municipal airport nearby. Uh, it's about 2009 to 2023, very few gaps, so a, a pretty good continuous record um, for the wind data. Um, and then also using the um, ASE 7 hazard tool, we're able to look at extreme wind data and, and determine those extremes, which is when we'd see um, those events during storms as well. Hurricanes and nor'easters, um, this, is, this is kind of where we're, we're looking at um, under what conditions we'd really want to look at it. So we have our, um, that's what we like to call the uh, spaghetti uh, noodle map, which shows all of the um, hurricanes back to about 1851 um, in the region. So you can see the different hurricane tracks to see which, you know, which way they, they typically um, affect the, the region and which way you'd see your winds um, and your strongest winds. And then we also have the um, US, oh, I misspelled that, USGS, um, coastal change hazards. And this gives um, an idea of what your nor'easter potential would be like in, in this region. So again, something that we can, can use in our design process. Um, good environmental data. We have a wetland inventory um, to help, help us uh, discern where, where we have wetlands which can you know, absorb floodwaters or, or see some of the changes that, that we'd um, want to include in any um, modeling analysis. And then um, the conservation lands, that also gives us an idea of development potential or areas that, that aren't um, developed and, and would um, maintain that ability to absorb floodwaters. Um, additional data that we found, uh, the town obviously has a, a great GIS um, platform, which is really helpful in identifying um, zoning, building outlines, parcels. So when we're looking at, at how floodwaters move, um, this is it's very helpful to, to have that information. And then one of the things we looked at was, were there any data gaps? Um, as we move from the conditions assessment, so what we found is there's, there's really good coverage on the um, water levels, the winds, the topography, the bathymetry, um, definitely a sufficient data set to be able to conduct the next steps of um, you know, condition assessment under what you want to operate the floodgate and um, to help design towards it. Things we, we would want to um, include, we'd want to get a lot more site-specific survey to make sure that we you know, verify the um, bathymetry and the topography maps, the LIDAR that I showed before and some of the bathymetry so that when you're doing your design that you have the specific um, you know, current relevant up-to-date coastal environments change, so we want to make sure that we have the most relevant, so we'd want to get a more detailed survey right at the um, project location. Um, and then things like this meeting, stakeholder input, because one of the things that's always very important um, in the design process that, that we find is, is getting feedback from um, the community, from property owners, from conservation groups, because you, that anecdotal evidence um, can really help uh, with the design um, to say, you know, oh, I saw in this storm, this happened here. It helps identify that more detailed um, information and that um, institutional knowledge that, that the community has. So that's, that's the assessment of what we've done so far, just collecting um, the data. What we would do next is the conditions assessment. So this is where we'd actually get into looking at some of the modeling and the analysis, taking all those, those data that we collected and looking at um, what scenarios that we would want the floodgate to be deployed under. And you know, one of the things, it's obviously to help um, protect the structures um, 
on the upland side from flooding, but we don't want to cause any adverse impacts. So we want to identify any scenarios under which um, there might be adverse impact potential. And that could be if there's a heavy rainfall precipitation event, um, you, you know, you have your floodgate um, closed, you could cause flooding on the backside because there's too much precipitation. So we'd want to identify those types of scenarios as well um, under you know, which way we're looking at operating the floodgates. So when you want to um, deploy it, but when you'd also want to uh, maybe open it as well. Um, so those are, are definitely very key things involved in um, the design and the conditions assessment and really making sure that, that everyone understands when the floodgate should be used and when it shouldn't be used. Um, so once we, we get that step done, we can go into the design um, and look at different alternatives. There's a couple different types of, of floodgates we can install. Um, so looking at the different design and, and based on the conditions assessment, what would be the best design for your community um, and for what you want to accomplish from it. Um, and like I said, we, we would want to tie these to very clearly definable um, operations. That really helps with emergency management and it helps everybody understand that these are, you know, when, when you hit this, check the box, time to go put the, the gate, um, deploy the gate. Um, so that, those things are, are um, very important for that. Um, simultaneously with the design, we'd also start the permitting process. Um, those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, getting uh, buy-in from the regulators, making sure there aren't any adverse impacts environmentally. Um, and then once you have everything lined up, then, then you get to construction. So, short and sweet, and I'll take any questions now. Yeah. So who's responsible for actually closing the gate uh, when there is a, a situation, especially now? I mean, do we even have processes and procedures? Do we have somebody identified as being responsible for doing it? I'm gonna <laughs> turn that one. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I make that call. Uh, for some reason, it's before my time. It was when the uh, structure was first built. Um, they put it in the deed that the harbor master would make that decision. But more, more accurately, you know, we have a pretty robust emergency management team. We would meet like we do before storms. This would be one of the items. Okay, are we going to deploy the gate or not deploy the gate? So we'd make it as a group. So, sorry, did everybody hear me? The answer to that? The uh, floodgate um, has existed for about 70 years. How many times has it been used? <laughs> Don't sit down. <laughs> yeah, <right>. uh, <laughs> I think, can you hear me? Repeat the question. I th Oh, okay. So the question was, how many times has the floodgate uh, been deployed? Um, I know that I've been involved uh, twice, um, but um, it, it, it actually in talking with our former uh, highway department supervisor, uh, Gibby Borthwick, he, uh, maybe it was more times. I just wasn't involved in that. I know Hurricane Bob, uh, it was deployed. Um, believe it was deployed during the Halloween storm, but uh, there was a lot of debate uh, about whether or not it should be deployed in that type of a storm. It really shouldn't be an easterly storm. You want the waters to leave. Um, it's this, my understanding is this structure is specifically designed for a westerly or southwesterly storm, hard winds, you know, 70 knots plus, um, and a storm surge. Having not been there, uh, I, the question. Well, uh, and the question is, uh, who uh, is is who's this floodgate going to help as far as uh, homeowners and and um, it's certainly 
people can, can debate that issue, I guess, but uh, certainly Little Beach area, those people trying to access Morris and Stage Island Road. So you're right, there was a lot less homes down there when this structure was built, and now there's more homes. So that's going to be part of the uh, analysis. Sure. Your personal recollection of what hit bottom, did you then flood again, and what was the result? Well, I can tell you the result on uh, this other question repeating the question, but the question was, what was the result of deploying the, um, uh, the floodgate for Hurricane Bob? Um, I can tell you that the times that I were invo was involved, uh, I guess it was a mixed result. I think it helped a lot for Hurricane Bob. I don't think it did for the Halloween storm. Uh, one of the issues is the construction is, if you're familiar with the floodgate, is all timber. And when you put the timber slots down to, uh, when you're deploying the floodgate, well, they get wet. Then they swell, and they're a misery to get out. Uh, so that'll be one of the things that we're, we're going to be looking at. Uh, back in, uh, we live on Stage Island, but back in 2018 when we did have the flooding, um, I went to a couple of the, the Little Beach meetings. One of the proposals there at that time, before the dune was built, uh, was that somehow put in a drainage system and actually use the marsh to, um, as, a, as a reservoir. Uh, that we, you would, in fact, reverse the process, put the floodgate in before to keep the water, Stage Harbor water, out so that this would be a resource for the Atlantic to drain into. Uh, so I guess the question is, uh, or you know, for information, uh, would that gate work both ways? C keep the water out as well as in? So that, that's something you can look at when you're looking at the conditions under which to deploy it. And, and I was kind of alluding to that as far as you don't want to back up the water, you know, by closing it. But if there is a way, you know, as you're looking at the scenarios, how where is the water going to go? That, that's what we're going to look at um, and under what conditions and look at those different storms. I, I was actually going to raise the same point that it was a <clears throat> interesting concept that as Little Beach was flooding, the, the water has nowhere to go. Yep. It doesn't drain. It's, the water table is very, very high. So in order to evacuate that water more efficiently, the gate would be maintained closed during you know, high tides creating that reservoir and then this passive drainage just presumably passive, not necessarily, to let that impounded water have a reservoir and then you open it up remotely or whatever. So it, it was an interesting concept that, you know, didn't go anywhere other than just kind of the idea. No, I'll look for that study. Did, did you say, though, I thought you said that uh, oh, no. it was meant nope. to I thought I heard you say that it was meant to protect storm, uh, storms coming from the south and Stuart saying coming from the west. Uh, could I get some clarity on it? Southwesterly. So it's, it's a range. It's not just one. So it's, it's a range of, of how the, sorry, of how the water is going to move. Um, and so that's what, what we, knowing that we have the data available, that's what we look at. What are those conditions? What would it protect against? What might it exacerbate? Um, so when wouldn't you want to keep it open? But it, we will look at a range um, of storms, not just one type of storm, to make sure that we're, you know, defining the operations of deploy it th at this time. You're not going to want to deploy it at this time. These are going to be the effects when you do that. Since uh, originally these were put in, um, Farrell Khan has done the dredging of the harbor, and he's built that sand dune that's lower than it used to be, but presumably it's going to be rebuilt as he drains, uh, he dredges again at some point his harbor, if not every other year that he's going to have to do that. Um, doesn't that provide considerable protection from uh, storm impact on th that basin in that area? Uh, it certainly does. Um, I think just follow up a little bit. The, the floodgate, as far as deploying the floodgate for just that floods, 
was certainly designed for s hard southwest winds, a hurricane, if you will. Um, Ted may want to follow up a little bit. I'm not sure it was ever meant to be designed when there's an easterly storm. It, it, as far as being deployed, certainly it lets the water out when you don't deploy the gate. Um, but I think it's it's really for those uh, hard southwest winds, and you know we just we just haven't had a lot of hurricanes. We've had a lot of close calls, uh, but not a lot of hurricanes hit Chatham and and create that environment where you would deploy that gate. If that helps at all. And I, I, I'm agreeing completely. I mean, with the changes in the outer beach, part of the concern of trying to deploy it is are we going to make matters worse because the flooding seems to be more prevalent from an east side event. Um, we, as George has said, we haven't really had the south events to a great extent to really, you know, seriously consider deploying it. And when we do start to consider it, it's usually an east event and we probably don't want to go there, whether or not it would even, you know, function anymore the way it's, it's current condition. So, so. I think you've already uh, answered this in a roundabout, but uh, directly speaking, what are the disadvantages disadvantages of deploying the gate um, when it's not necessary? Flooding. <laughs> so you'll you'll if you're deploying it um, when it's kind of the opposite storm and you're building up water on the other side, you'll exacerbate the flooding um, because it won't have an outlet to release. So you definitely want to would be flooding in the inner stage harbor. Yes. And do you have an estimate on what the feet would be? I haven't done that analysis yet. <laughs> so that would be that would be part of the analysis and the next step. Thank you. So under what circumstances are we looking at the practicality of rebuilding this floodgate because the circumstances that it was built under back in 1961 are certainly much different now. I mean, are we going forward with more studies under the assumption that the town wants to replace it? That, that's, ex that's exactly what we're going through presently. I mean, one of the... Um, initial conversations we had with Geosyntec was to, okay, we've got to collect all this data because it is old and we don't have put it all together to determine, I think, maybe where you're leading, which is, do we need it? The, I, I think the answer is, uh, uh, Maura can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the answer is yes, we do need it. And um, for those infrequent hurricanes that come up from the uh, south, and hit us from a southwesterly, and, and that storm surge that comes into Stage Harbor. Um, we're not fully through this, this project, but it seems to be where we're headed. So, Stuart, if I understand correctly, the last time we, it was deployed was in 1993. Have there been times in the, the preceding 30 years that we would have wanted to deploy it and couldn't? So, uh, as I kind of indicated before, we really take a hard look at whether we're doing, as Ted pointed out correctly, you know, are we doing more harm than good by deploying it? And my feeling is that under most storm conditions that Chatham faces, deploying it would probably cause more harm than good. However, that does not, in because we've had such infrequent hurricanes, the last one being uh, uh, Hurricane Bob in 91, um, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to predict how we'll need it in the future, but I think you're going to need it for hurricanes. We almost, uh, you know, last year, if you remember, we had a hard southwest wind, and there was a fair amount of flooding. I hadn't seen flooding in our workshop at Stage Island, or Stage Harbor Road since March of 93, and we almost had water in the building. So that's just kind of an example. In March of 93, we, did, uh, we didn't deploy the gate, in my recollection, um, but uh, that's the type of storm that we probably would be looking at are we are we f when the storm hits or the hurricane hits is it during high tide do we have moon tides i mean there's a lot of things that you're going to want to consider and we do and th th the majority of the time we've decided not to deploy it
All right, so as part of this study, will be, you be looking at the hydraulic capacity of the existing uh, bridge structure as well? And the reason I ask is because we've had some settlement on the approaches. Uh, we believe the tidal action is pulling some of the sediment from between the timbers on the abutments. And we may need to, at some point, do some structural work um, that may reduce the actual hydraulic opening. So I'd like to, that to be part of the kind of the whole overall look, if we can. Thank you. That's, and that's exactly what this type of meeting is for, because that is really good information to have, because um, that will affect the analysis. And it, it would be good to know, um, you know how that might change so that we can do the correct analysis so that you don't, you know, we do it for this size and all of a sudden it's this size. <laughs> um, so yes, um, I'll put that. One of the reasons, as Stuart said, we've kind of been doing this in steps is to really get this feedback and make sure that, that you know, we're kind of taking a pause at each step um, to make sure that we're, we're doing the appropriate. Hi, Cindy Bassett, um, um, property owner on Little Beach. Um, so can you just explain to me, because there's lots of things in my, my head are not clear. Um, is the purpose of it to prevent flooding on Little Beach or to prevent flooding in Stage Harbor? Can you just simplify that for me? The flooding um, up in, in Stage Harbor is, is where we're looking at. Uh, I think you may not be familiar with Little Beach. Little Beach is, um, let's say, to the southeast of, uh, of the floodgate. So okay. um, yes, that's what we're looking at. Uh, uh, that seems to be the most vulnerable and why we're going through this process. Um, you know, Ted and I had kind of brainstorming before we engaged with Geosyntec, discussing, OK, is it need? We know we need to do something with the floodgate because it's deteriorated. And what do we replace it with? Under what conditions, you know, do we replace it? And that's exactly what we're trying to go through. Now, Stage Harbor proper, uh, you know, the coastal environment in Stage Harbor, I mean, I don't think it's going to help any flooding in there by deploying or not deploying the floodgate. Um, and just to clarify a little bit, you know, what the, uh, one of the previous speakers said, yes, under the road there, uh, I think, is it a wo part wooden structure or something? Uh, because the last four years, five years, twice they've had to come out and patch because holes have actually appeared in Morris Island Road. Um, and I assume that is because this, the structure is coming apart. You're right, exactly. That, that, that structure is, in, is old, it's in hard shape. Uh, it's uh, what we looked at. You know, if you remember, it was quite overgrown. We had a storm prediction. I think it was one of the hurricanes rec in recent years. So we went down and cleared all the brush and all the you know, ivy that was growing so we could uh, be ready to deploy it if we chose. Well, then we discovered that you know, it was in, we had to take a closer look at the structure to see uh, whether we knew it needed attention, what kind of attention is really what we're trying to get to. My name is Kathy Cardiff, and I'm one of the uh, Little Beach homeowners that we were talking about, and it's my co-Little Beach people here. B okay, and the, one of the big problems we have, our homes are right on the conservation land in the back when the, the bridge is up the street, and when we have any kind of storms, it comes right into our whole conservation land in the back. We have two culverts that go underneath the road. They're always clogged up. No water goes underneath. I have a picture of it. The water goes onto the road, Morris Island, comes back in our backyard up to our decks, and stays there for a long time. Over these years now, all those beautiful trees we had there in the conservation is gone. They're all dead. All the bushes are all dead. It's just plain sand. It's a sad thing that that happened, that that wasn't kept clear to keep the water flowing and going over where it's supposed to be across the street in conservation land over there also. But that was made for to catch all this water that comes through. So I was just wondering that is something that's going to be addressed also, that the under the, the road scenario with the ditches going to be cleaned out also when this, the new design comes in. 
very important for us. Not only there, but it's important in other parts of the community that those culverts be kept clear. They serve a purpose. Um, one of the things that this study will be taking a look at and recommending that uh, they, they just need more attention. Yes, thank you. So in the state of Massachusetts, there must be some other uh, installations of floodgates similar to this or f serving a similar purpose that were, we'll say, maintained or engineered in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Do you have a, is there uh, something better than, uh, rail for the lack of a better word, railroad ties for the material that doesn't swell? Um. There have been design changes since the 1950s, so yes, there are, are different types of, of floodgates possible. Um, and so that's what we're also going to look at, because there are different types that have different purposes as well. So looking at um, how to deploy them, um, and, and like you said, materials that are easily deployable, um, so that you, know, you don't have the situation where you come up with, oh, we want to deploy it, and we can't, so yes. So one of this size for, uh, we'll say, the infrequency based on back history, I don't know what's coming at us, you, you probably wouldn't be thinking about an automated uh, gate uh, that would work with the push of a button. <laughs> It's, it's something we can look at because that, you know, as, as we're looking at this process, we will look at the costs. And that's something, you know, when you look at the whole engineering, that's something you can present is if you want this, that's what it costs. If you want this, that's what it costs. So we will, we will look at the, the different types. It doesn't mean that, you know, it'll be the Cadillac versus the... <laughs> IMAX. Yes, yeah, the Timex. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, just a tangent on <clears throat> that specifically... Part of the issues, I, I believe, in the uh, consideration of deploying or not is once it's deployed, perhaps appropriately at the time, and then the area adjacent to it, the roadway is flood, and then you want to pull it out, you can't get there. So the automated approach has some logic to it that you don't need to try to go through the floodwaters in order to open the gate again. So it's, it's a, because the, the difference between the height of the gate and the roadways that are going to flood over in current conditions anyway is not that substantially different. So you really have a few feet of freeboard between the roadway and the gate protection. I, I think it, if you can get to it, a manual system would be better. An automated system, I mean, I think that'd be kind of cool. I just use my clicker and I do it from my office. If I could do that for the drawbridge, this would be very helpful. Um, but they don't, they, they always fail when you need them, those automated types. So we're going to have to look at that real hard. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just sense that this study is taking on a much bigger life than just the doors, right? We're talking about the bridge now needing repair. We're talking about the culverts. Uh, we haven't really, I don't think, spoken about what flooding is coming from the easterly side up uh, outermost harbors uh, ramp and up the street and doing so on. Uh, is this going to take on a much bigger picture? And what's your sense of the timing of when this study is going to be done and uh, results to be presented? This study is specifically geared toward the operation of the tide gate, of the floodgate and under what conditions should we deploy it now that we think we need it. This study may lead to bigger questions like that. I wouldn't be su at all surprised, but that's a much bigger program that uh, is going to be much more involved. But um, it, may, it I mean, may lead there. There's a lot of issues down there flooding from many different directions. But Stu, I mean, don't we have to prioritize? Uh, and what I'm saying is we're, we're here today because of the floodgates. Right from a priority standpoint of where the, the biggest potential is that we're going to get flooding down in the general area, is this priority number one or is it moreover for to what's, what's happening on the east side of uh, storms coming from the east? Right. And uh, so 
What we're dealing with now and what we're going to concentrate now on is the floodgate, primarily during those hard southwest winds and uh, when to deploy the floodgate and, uh, and what can we expect that might happen as a result of that. You're absolutely right. We're getting a lot of flooding and more often from the east. But this is a structure that we have now and needs to be addressed because it's deteriorated. We're going to go there. I think maybe Ted can comment a little bit on the flooding from the east as far as uh, I, I know that there's been some studies done on some fixes, but uh, it's, it's a much bigger, it's a much bigger program, floods coming from the east, and it's far more complicated. Um, Mary Hoffman, and I also am um, a Little Beach uh, resident. Um, it seems to me that if you're studying the floodgate, what I'm hearing you saying is you need to gather quite a bit of information, and one action on that floodgate could affect the other side. Is that correct? I just wanted to know if you're aware that after the April Fool's storm and the break, that a Little Beach Association was formed, and we gathered a tremendous amount of data and we also presented it to the town, and I think that might be information you could use. Absolutely, absolutely. I think this is for Stuart. Um, going back to Ted's response about uh, if you can't get there because the road is flooded, I started thinking, well, if the road is flooded, there's no floodgate. Uh, that's going to work because it's already gone over the top of it, or there's so many other low spots uh, yep. where it can come in. And I'm thinking of actually the docks at the headwater of Johnson Creek or Johnson mm -hmm. River. You, the, the floodgate doesn't stop that. And it'll, it'll come right across, won't yeah. it? And, and we've experienced that. Uh, the, I think where Ted was headed was, okay, how do we get there to remove the floodgate so those waters can recede and, and that timing. That's, that's, that's been a problem in the past, is getting there, being able to retrieve, uh, remove the floodgate uh, immediately, my perspective, immediately after we get a southwest uh, storm. So any water that did go over, as you're pointing out, can get out. I, I don't know if you received it. We we have done, following the 18 uh, storm events in Little Beach, we do have a storm tide pathway analysis done by the Center for Coastal Studies that does do a lot of that discussion of where the storm waters come from, both east and west. And, and to follow up, because you, know, you had a good question or comment, and it may be this analysis finds that, okay, it'll be effective, like the uh, structures down in Louisiana, you know, it'll be effective for these types of hurricanes, but if it gets above that, don't deploy it. <coughs> it's not gonna be effective enough, as, a, as an example. I don't know what, if that's gonna, but that could be <coughs> a result. Which will be compounded, just to state the obvious, with sea level rise. Yeah, sure. So. Is there any other questions, comments? What's your thought on the timing of it coming back with the next step of this study? So, um, <laughs> oh, uh, what's the timing for the next step of this study? Um, it's certainly uh, during the um, summer, we'll probably engage with the next phase, late summer, middle of the summer, uh, for carrying this forward. Just one comment. This was designed by the Corps of Army Engineers and built before there was a Cape Cod winter. 
it was it was built in concert with the with the dredging of Stage Harbor and the the uh, installation of the current uh, channel in Stage Harbor. Yeah, they're about the same time. Little clarification. <coughs> it was built right before the new inlet was created, but there has always been an inlet in the right. Stage Harbor, obviously in its old configuration. So it was when the dike was constructed and the roadways were rearranged and they wanted to maintain at a minimum the, the, the flow into that tidal system and they incorporated the tide gate into that. Um, and I just wanted to highlight because we deal with it in other types of projects, it's a core project presumably, they build it during the permitting, Stuart knows where I'm headed here, you're probably gonna have to coordinate with the core as a 408 type issue. Oh yeah, which won't yep. make any sense to anybody else, but it's makes it's sense to us. <laughs> it, I think I'll put it in a nutshell for Ted. This is not going to be quick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll do it right after they finish the bridges because I don't want to do it. <laughs> right after the next hurricane. Just one last question: Is this part of an overall climate resiliency plan for the town? And how does that, you know, how are we working together? to prioritize projects throughout town for climate resiliency and, and storms? Well, certainly this is related to sea level rise and resiliency, um, but as just a, we are focusing on this tide gate, what conditions we're gonna deploy the tide gate and what effects under what conditions it, might, it may have. You're right in that uh, there, there's, there's bigger discussions going on about resiliency. Uh, we've just got through a few waterfront projects as an example at the Fish Pier and at Stage Harbor. In both cases, we raised the structure uh, above the water current water levels, frankly more than I would have liked to have seen because it, it makes those structures difficult to work out of. Um, so we came up with a happy compromise trying to raise them for resiliency and sea level rise, but also keeping them a functional uh, waterfront facility for commercial and recreational vessels. Stuart, doesn't it make sense though if we're gonna put new gates in, if that's the end result, that we fix the bridge before we put the, the gates in? Well, the, <laughs> as long as the bridge doesn't go underwater, it currently works. Um, <laughs> Uh, there was some issues at, as uh, when it was first constructed and, and given over to the town, but those issues have long been, you know, we, we've worked through those. Um, the approach is, is something we'll look at, but I've seen those issues on the approaches and my sense is, yes, it might be related to sea level rise, but it also might be, you know, it just wasn't maybe designed or constructed as well as it could have been. But I, I see those as relatively minor issues in the in the short to medium term as, as far as those approaches to the bridge and i'm just going to remind folks that we the town are engaged with the commission as part of a uh, comprehensive low-lying roads analysis um, we have selected two which is the way the program is working with the commission two roadways to look at in more detail, although the detail is only at a concept stage, Morris Island Road is included in that assessment. So, you know, we're looking more at the lower areas, as I indicated, by Little Beach, but this whole section is part of the awareness of the low-lying roads, you know, problem. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, uh, this will be on, uh, up on the town's uh, site, so you can, uh, you can view it there. And any questions, are they, can they go through yep. me or do you want to contact you? Either way. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put, um, you may regret this, but we'll put uh, Moore's <laughs> uh, contact info where uh, people can ask questions.